So I'm also going to be doing more work. Uh, you know that this weekend is going to be one of the biggest uh, music festivals in India. Forget North India, I think it's the biggest music festival in uh, Delhi ever. Uh, I don't think Delhi's seen a big music festival other than if uh, some of you folks who have been in Delhi for a long time would remember stuff like Cornucopia and all which happened in schools. After that, I don't think there's been a music festival in Delhi. So these are the guys behind MH7 Weekend there. The, they are the coolest people to come up on stage today. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, if you haven't heard of NH7, as I said, if you've been living under a rock, uh, these guys uh, are not only India's uh, largest music website, they've done a TV show as well, Divorists. Um, I read that you're about to start a magazine uh, in a very one of the nicest caravan pieces I've ever read about somebody. Um, and uh, they're getting, in, they're changing the music model in India by doing live events, by doing uh, TV shows, by doing a proper multimedia model for music. Um, the music industry in India is quite different from the music industry anywhere else in the world. Um, and we'd like to know from uh, the guys at Only Much Louder how they have done this what they see, how they see music evolving going forward, and uh, why traditional media is still important. I mean, uh, would I like to know why a magazine? I guess that's the first question I have to ask for you. Why a magazine? Uh, uh, we have some music magazines in India already, so why do you think uh, OML had to start a magazine? We'll find out in a year's time or so, because uh, as of now, we know that we have a great content team. It seems like um, uh, the online magazine is doing pretty well. Uh, I see no reason why something that's a traditional magazine can't do that well. Um, the large issue has been that magazines typically don't have a great subscriber base in India. Uh, we already have a large community that we reach out to. Um, between all the shows that we do, we sell between 200 to 250,000 odd tickets. Uh, so we know exactly who they are, who are the people, what kind of content that they consume. Um, and I think that gives us the opportunity to publish a magazine the way we want it. Uh, it doesn't need to be a music magazine, uh, it's going to be a lot more than that. Um, yeah, and we also want to kind of experiment with that model and see how it works. All right, um, also uh, the music model in India was quite different from the music model in the West. Uh, you did not have uh, large album sales driving it. It has always been to an extent going back to the day, even looking at uh, language, uh, regional language, popular music has always been live shows. Uh, artists have always sung uh, at weddings even. Um, but how is, how is that evolving now with online in India? Uh, and what was the entire concept behind uh, doing a TV show as well? Uh, not much has changed. Artists still doing weddings. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what we call the silly money gig and that always will keep happening in this Do you think a Parikrama will play at a wedding? Yeah, for the right money, anyone will play anything. Yeah, that's at least my belief. Um, it really boils down to, um, I think what's really changed, yes, of course, the model in India was different. There was a model abroad, India never had a model. Um, here, basically, was everything that happened around Bollywood. The music industry in India existed as a support system for Bollywood. The space that we operate in is the independent space. Uh, we do, it, it's not just rock music, anything that's not Bollywood will go after that. That's kind of really been our belief. And that ecosystem really thrives online. The reason our company exists or we've done well is because what late 99, 2000, the biggest and the best thing ever happened for music for us is people started pirating music. Uh, the moment that happened, all barriers broke. We knew where to find our fans. Uh, we didn't have to go through labels. We didn't have to go through managers um, like us. People could, uh, fans could directly get all the music that they needed. Um, and once that was done, yeah, so in, in short, the piracy bit was actually the whole reason and uh, everything changed for the independent music business and that's the reason it survives. So OML is there because of MP3s? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And Napster. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, you've already done the app today. So um, how is, uh, I mean, for, of course, the MP3 has changed everything, but how are smartphones and uh, tablets and new technology, I mean, applications? Mm -hmm. Where else do you see music ap applications going? I think a lot of what we do is built around the community we operate in. Um, I think we're one of the few companies in India who actually 
caters to a very specific community. We can clearly draw a boundary around people and say this is our community. We know that th that community quite well. And when we build something, we are building something our community will use. And a lot of people outside this community will be drawn into this community because they're using things we built. So the music app, especially the festival app which we launched today, is a core product for people in our community. But there's a lot of people in the audience today who used it and hence will attend a festival because they just found out about it and then become a part of the community. So I think the future is going to be building more community products which get more people into our uh, space. So building stuff using for the online community and drawing them to offline events. I don't think it, I don't make a differentiation between online, offline, and TV. It's a community. As long as the identity is defined by what they listen to, what they watch, what they wear, where they go, uh, that's our space. I think we are very simply, we are very clear. We are in the business of content. If that content happens in the form of an event, that's fine. If it's a television show, that's fine. If it's online, that's fine. Uh, we've stopped drawing that line in terms of there's the online division, there's the offline thing. Uh, I'm more of an analog sort of guy. This is, you know, Shreyas brings the nerd in OML. Um, and a simple thing is when you kind of go to a festival right now, what annoys me most about festivals that we do is 80% of our audience will come and I think their primary objective in a festival is to tweet uh, or is to click pictures and put it on Facebook, whereas I used to go to concerts to watch the bands. Uh, but if they're doing that anyway, then they might as well use our app. That's the way uh, we are kind of really thinking about it. And that's why we have, uh, it's really become important for a company which was a very on-ground event-driven company to have people who really understand technology because now it's all the same um, and we don't really differentiate between the online and offline bit at all. So you don't mind people, you think people at Megadeth will not be headbanging but phones up in the... I'm always on stage, trust me. The only thing that I see is about five years back it used to be this and now it's just a phone. You know, and, so and all of them are recording videos and putting it up? <laughs> no, no of that. Some bands have an issue. I mean, it's not comfortable when it's a mosh pit and you're throwing around smartphones, yeah. it's expensive, but otherwise it's all fine. <laughs> a mosh pit with iPhone 5s, yeah, you guys can make a lot of money by <laughs> picking them up. Um, but tell me something, I mean, uh, it, this is a huge change that's been driven, I mean, piracy. But what, it is, what is it like for a young Indian band, you know, the, uh, you know, somebody in class 10, he loves playing the drums, his friends have vocals and guitars, they want to form a band. Um, is there a viable route for them to make money? My first recollection of watching a live band was a friend of mine who played and there were three people in the audience. Okay, okay. and to a, to a young band, there are more places to play now and there's more opportunity and I think a lot more people are interested in the music. So I think we've come a long way from 10 years ago. And do you think, uh, sorry, do you think uh, Western music companies can learn from your model? Or have they been speaking to you guys about in doing this uh, this sort of stuff in the West and doing this entire multimedia because over there they got really badly affected by piracy? I think we are learning from our own model. We are just going as it goes. Uh, we don't really, we never sat down and said, oh, this is what we're going to do six months from now. Whatever makes sense from a business model perspective, we just do that um, at, at this moment. Um, just going back to whether artists can make money right now, every artist in the country, we manage a good, we work with about 100 odd artists. Uh, so be it, uh, across the board, someone as big as an Indian Ocean or could be a new artist, everyone's making more money than they ever did before and for that the single catalyst has actually has been technology and MP3s and all of that. So do you think the model that some of these guys follow of giving their music away for free? Everyone's giving their music away for free. I think music only should be given away for free right now. It's just the effort of going and putting it up and selling it is too, too much. Uh, it's just easier to give it away for free and all the revenue comes from live shows. Okay. So live show revenue as well as doing some other interesting things online and uh, bands make money. Yeah, um, uh, the money that you would make by selling 100,000 downloads is what you'd get paid in two concerts. So I think the effort is to try and see that you give away as many free downloads as you can so that people will turn up for your concerts and thus you make more money. Okay, um, any questions from the audience? We, I, I want to make this a more interactive session. So uh, please come, the mics out here so this guys can keep on coming. Yeah, Nikhil, you always have the first question. Carry on. Yes, I will give you free alcohol this weekend at the festival. <laughs> <laughs> no, just make sure it goes in the mosh pit, huh? Yes. Nikhil in the mosh pit, it will be fun. And just upload that video. I have been in the mosh pit. So that's a different thing. But um, I don't know if you've asked this well. Uh, what do you think film companies should do right now? 
film companies. Yeah. What What do you think? Apart so from making better films. <laughs> apart from making uh, Apart from making better films, what do you think, guys? Uh, what do you think film producers should do right now with music, or and simultaneously, what do you think music labels should do? Uh, that film related music labels should do because you're obviously taking a model uh, you're taking independent music and taking it cross media uh, they are become films are becoming increasingly dependent on that uh, on on mobile uh, crbt which is going down uh, i'm assuming revenue some music for them are going to be really really uh, stretched so what do you if you were uh, doing film music and uh, will you do film music and what would you do sorry this is a long convoluted question where should I start? <laughs> uh, I'll start with a simple one. Will we do film music? If there's great music and if you're probably making the film, we might as well do the music. Uh, we have a production house, we make television shows right now. Um, and the idea is to try and promote as much of the music that we're involved with. Um, second, what can the film labels and the mainstream labels learn from us? I don't know whether, like I said, there is nothing to be learned. We operate in a different system. So what works for us might not work for the film label at all. And the fact remains that take a big artist, let's say a Vishal Shekhar, Shankar Hassan, Law and Shan, put them in FN circuit this weekend and charge a 3,000 rupee ticket and the fact is people won't turn up because that audience can't pay a 3,000 rupee ticket. But you put Parikrama, Pentagram, Indian Ocean, six stages and 80 bands, people pay 3,000 rupees and turn up because the audience that listens to them are happy to spend that money. So we operate in a completely different space. So our live needs, digital, that kind of a space, I don't know whether it can apply for film labels. So the question is, what would you do? If you what? were doing film music, what would you do with it? If you were doing film music, I get all the publishing rights, sell it off, live on an island. <laughs> um, it's it's hard to kind of see what you would do because um, a lot of their revenues traditionally has come from physical sales, and you know I think VAS is just dropping in a fairly massive way in terms of revenues that uh, that's coming from uh, mo uh, mobile devices at the moment. Um, I would really start going back and investing a bit more on A and R and discovering and pushing some of the newer artists as well because they've been very, very dependent on star-driven movies. So right now, music sells because there's a particular star in it. So without that, and I think sooner or later, all production houses, which I think UTV started doing it recently where they distribute their own music, it's just a matter of time till all the big production houses in India will start doing that. And a lot of the film labels might just become redundant in that sense. So unless they go and invest in artists um, and good old school A&R, uh, they're not going to be left with a bigger bag of content. They'll just be uh, administering publishing for catalog content. So you're saying that uh, people will go and listen to Vishal Dadlani if he's playing for Pentagram rather than going and listening to him if he is no, doing No, of course, different people listen. The question is whether they'll pay a 3,000 rupee ticket. I think it's Vishal Dadlani as Vishal Shekhar has a very mass audience. Whether they would pay a very high premium ticket, they might not, but the Pentagram fans would. Okay. Um, just one more thing here before I come there. So just. Uh, when, when things go online and, and when people are willing to pay, um, do you see that amount also increasing among uh, Indians as well? I mean, somebody, you're saying they're willing to pay, they may not be able to pay 3,000 today, but do you think they suppose they'd be able to pay a s reasonable amount of money tomorrow? Yeah, I think we're already seeing that. Uh, we launched uh, a section on Flipkart, which is just about independent music. And a lot of people in music from the store because it's not really available for free download anymore. A lot of it, uh, see, some amount of music is always going to be free, but some people would still want to buy music. And as long as that option is available, people will do that. What is the scale of that? Honestly, we don't know. But we think there's a specific section of the audience who are buying music today. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, according to me, the biggest problem about live music India is shortage of venues across states where you can actually take it down to B rung and C rung cities. You know, have small concerts. So, how do you see that that sphere changing in time to come? Uh, have you seen any difference last three four years? It's um, this year. Look at the number of bands that's come to India this year is collectively more than the number of bands that have come in the last ten years put together. So, it's uh, right now is the gold rush in the concert scene. Uh, that's purely because um, I think there's better infrastructure. People are spending more on tickets, and you had Swedish House Mafia was coming in. They sold 10,000 tickets in a day, uh, in a day's time. That never used to happen because people used to wait till the last minute and buy. Uh, so that audience is getting more comfortable spending on credit cards. Um, massive opportunity for ticketing companies when it comes to music. Uh, as far as the venues are concerned, um, 
venues licensing, these are the easiest excuses promoters can use to say that music is not being promoted. You have an open field, you have a venue. What else do you really need? And there are a lot of open fields. It, you might not have that in a Bombay. That's pretty much the only city where you don't have any of those. But every other city in the country has enough open venues. And if it's not there, then just build one. Um, what about issues? I mean, um, this time last year, not very far from this hotel, uh, <laughs> there was utter chaos when Metallica played. Mm -hmm. um, security is still an issue. I mean, uh, for example, what, what are you guys doing um, for this week, uh, for Sunday, when Megadeth plays? Uh, are you, I mean, uh, how do you control fans? It's, it's, it's a logistical question, but uh, what are you guys doing over there? Uh, it's fairly straightforward. Um, the reason that happened was there were more people who were sold tickets than the venue could accommodate, and then of course things would kind of go wrong. Uh, the reason we look, and we're doing the festival at the Formula One boot circuit, so we, are, we have about 30 acres, the whole festival site is being built in 30 acres, uh, it can never sell out unless 150,000 people turn up, which is not going to happen. Um, so there's, as long as there's enough space, um, it's the most secure site that we've ever seen, uh, because there is a private security force, there's about 200 other guards that we kind of bring in. So arranging that security is not so hard, and any concert that we've ever done is a limited capacity concert. We decide that there's going to be 7,000 tickets, 8,000 tickets, then we just stop selling. Um, and I think if you cut down on the greed part in that part, on that aspect, like we did David Guetta and we sold out all the three concerts, we could have accommodated another two to three in each gig, but the thing was it gets uncomfortable and then it becomes a riot. Uh, so if you're fine making it a limited capacity concert, there, typically there won't be security issues. So you're fine doing that? I mean, you oh, Absolutely. Uh, any? I have. Well, then, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Deepika. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, there's always uh, a huge divide in people who listen to music created by Indians and people who don't. Do you think there's a possibility or there's a viable uh, business model to actually introduce Indian music on a large scale, like on a radio station or something like that, and people will consume it, like bridge that gap between Indian music and just you know, consuming Backstreet Boys still. Mm. Uh, and what people listen to, I mean, it really is subjective. Uh, radio stations are playing the most commercial thing possible and still not making money. So if I had to go and say, you know, play something that people are not listening to, that's kind of suicide for them anyway. Um, uh, I, I read a stat recently, uh, YouTube in India is the biggest platform to discover music and that platform is open to all. Right, it's open to a band it, to who's playing the first show to somebody making a movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's a shortage of people discovering Indian bands. I don't think that's true anymore. It was probably true five years ago. And we can see that. I mean, things like what's really helped is Coke Studio, Doveris, stuff like that going on mainstream television. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely increased the number of people who know who Ravi Dikshit is or an Indian Ocean are right now. So uh, I think mainstream There's still a huge gap. Like, there is. Well, there will be a huge gap because of the sheer number of people who don't have access to content. It's another 10 15 years away till I think that will be um, kind of at par. So, what do you think is a solution to that? Uh, or maybe to, uh, to, to work away towards it, towards bridging the gap. Bring all your friends to the festival. Uh, let them see what's going on. Uh, and I think the reason we're kind of taking the festival to multiple cities, these are the things that we can do in terms of take the music to the people, um, price it cheap, uh, don't have a major premium in terms of that people can't afford it. Uh, but it's going to take a really slow time. It's just happened very quick in the last four or five years. And all this happened from nowhere. We are about four people to about 80 odd people right now. And that's happened in the last two years. Um, so it's kind of, ca there is some momentum. Uh, but you don't want to go nuts about it and you know start doing 100 music festivals. I think if you, I think the direction is right and the pace is right. It just needs to go in that direction. Um, okay. Just to ask again about the technology front. Um, 15 years ago, uh, Macarena came out. It took a while to get. Uh, the only person who remembers that. I was in class 12. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly old, <laughs> but um, this, I mean, Gangnam Style has come out. Um, what, uh, July, I think the guy released the video and I was checking yesterday 400 million plus views on YouTube. Um, you said YouTube has become the largest music delivery platform in India. It, it ha Hasn't it changed the dynamics of music delivery across the world? I mean, Gangnam Style is, uh, is the style right now. <laughs> Mikhail mm -hmm. Scale is doing it. Again, I think Gundam Style is a bad example to take because there are a lot of bands who put up music and then get 300 views and get very disappointed that they didn't get 210 million. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all have to be very realistic about building our audience. 
something when we when we started NH7.in, one of one of our challenges was build this audience, but build this audience slowly. It's not going to be 210 million like Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style was not popular because of the music. It was a very funny dance move. Uh, yeah, there was a Yahoo engineer called. Yeah, also the dance, never the music. Correct. Right. So that's an aberration. You ca that's not the norm. The norm is. You put out great content, there is a platform out there where people will discover it and over time you will build your audience. And again, that audience is very related, but the fact that you have an open platform is a huge plus com compared to five years ago when there wasn't any. I think the day everyone, including the smallest of towns, can get great access to things like YouTube uh, at a mass level and it's fast, uh, for us the landscape completely changes because we sell 20, 15,000 20,000 tickets per festival just by advertising on pretty much AdWords and Facebook. Uh, our entire advertising spend is the cost of one ad in Bombay Times and we still sell more tickets because ATL is absolutely useless for things like what we do. Uh, the people who are listening to our kind of music are not reading Bombay Times, Delhi Times, newspaper, any of that. Uh, in fact, if I go and do a page 3 article, it affects the, the kind of people that comes to my... We are very elitist about what people will come for, what kind of festivals that we are putting together. Uh, and it's much, if I'm bringing a Megadeth, it's easy for me to target every metal fan who is watching metal videos on YouTube, and that happens at the fraction of a cost of doing that on print. Uh, so the more people get access, easier things are for us. One of the things which we see a lot when we do digital marketing for our events is mainstream media is to a large extent credibility. Yeah. Because I think when you get an ad in the newspaper and people see it, they feel reaffirmed that this event's going to happen. Somebody, well, somebody who has some amount of access is making this event and putting it together. But all the conversion happens digitally, right? Everyone finding out about it, converting to a ticket sale, coming to the festival is all digital. Um, how much? I mean, what's your average traffic on your website right now? Uh, we do about 120,000 uniques a month. That's significant. So then this has grown over the last four years. Uh, and it's been, been live for a couple of years now. I so think our audience size is about half a million people. And yeah. we're fine. We find that half a million people can spend and they'll keep spending as long as you keep putting together great concerts. Um, we are not in the business of reaching out to 20, 30 million odd people. That happens when we do something like a doerist or you know, work on larger television stuff. But that's also fairly niche. Uh, we're very happy and content with niche. You don't want to? I mean, so you're looking at the... English speaking audience. Okay, can one question I guess many people want to know? Uh, go ahead, please. Um, you guys just came up with the festive app. Mm -hmm. um, do you, what are your views on a similar app which um, works uh, only towards promoting music, something like a Spotify or a Pandora for uh, Indian independent artists? Um, in, I started something on radio about 10 years ago trying to do that. Um, I think there is space, there's always space for people to promote. Um, a good music solution uh, but our increasing understanding is it's a mix people want to listen to a megadeth with a parikrama or with a bhayanak mouth in in the same sequence so i think there's a great opening for some for a solution which allows you to listen to all kinds of music but seats in the right kind of indian music for you to discover music i think it's, it's fairly straightforward in music the three piece of marketing work really well which is pink floyd pearl jam and parikrama uh, <laughs> as long as you're playing the first two people will discover the third one it's as simple as that so if you do something as you know saying oh, this is going to be only independent music uh, you're already preaching to the converted yeah. uh, so you need to have access to all forms of music um, and, you know if you really want to con convert people at a mass level in that sense yeah. right so if you introduce like no okay not just independent art artists but you include like similar I say Spotify model working perfectly fine uh, in terms of just it having kind of that access just the way you and Ghana is a good example it has actually all the content that you would possibly need but we don't really see massive user uh, a user base within our audiences for that because they really perceive Ghana as a Bollywood thing so I think if you use a similar platform, brand it separately, have all that content, that branding aspect for this audience is very, very important. Like you said, this credibility thing and who talks about it, uh, we started realizing that you know getting covered by the Caravan and the Tehelka and the Open Magazine is more important for our audience than being on India Today or Bombay Times or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's what we are trying to find and I think if that credibility question is solved, a lot of the others kind of comes in. Any more questions on the floor? Yeah. Where do you buy your t-shirts? This is, uh, he just gave away our e-commerce plan. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
this is actually uh, the All India Bachchod official T-shirt. Who are a bunch of great guys that everyone should listen to. Um, hi, Mona. Uh, the question: um, There is Radio Indigo, which has been playing English music in Bangalore and Goa. Uh, there's been Jazz Goa, who's been playing a lot of local musicians in uh, Goa during a slot on Sunday, five onwards. Um, is any of that helpful to the overall endeavor? Helpful in some way. I don't know just who listens to radio. Um, I think till internet radio really takes up and I think it goes in a massive way, maybe it will help. It does help in the ecosystem in some way, I guess. But radios, I mean, from whatever I know, radio is just while you're driving your car. That's 95% of all radios. Most of our fans can't afford cars. Yeah. And it's like you can't drive cars in Bombay. I'm uh, <laughs> sure they, they spend all the, you know, the EMI buying tickets here for your shows. Alcohol. <laughs> we sell, we sell Bukhari by the bucket, so that's where it all kind of goes. And we're not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you guys aren't complaining, but uh, okay, so one question I guess everybody wants to know. Um, after Megadeth, who are the big, other big guys they're bringing in? And will you get in somebody a bit more current? I actually know they're bringing in more uh, Not absolutely. guys whose brains are idled by so many drugs that they talk out of shit sometimes nowadays. Yeah, I could, I could kind of name it. I mean, which are the next. I know we just announced Nora Jones um, recently, so that's something we're going to do. And we have another four headliners confirmed. Um, but this is the worst room to say, I'll tell you, but don't tell anyone else. It's just kind of. <laughs> so I can't. Everybody's on Twitter right now. Yeah. Uh, but you, you will have a No Metal Nora coming in. Uh, yeah, oh, and, but, you, but you do a bit of everything. You're doing Nora Jones, you're doing uh, Megadeth, you're doing... I think yeah, because most of us, I'm, I'm just bringing in bands I want to listen to. It's fairly straightforward. It's a very selfish I'm building apps I want to use. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, that's the best way, right? I mean, you should have an eclectic taste in music. It should bring in everybody. I think the idea of NH7 and a festival like that is six stages, six different <laughs> styles of music, and everything comes together. And I think if we continue any longer, Nikhil's going to run on stage and do the Gangnam style, so. <laughs> um, Nikhil, uh, Gangnam style, yeah. but that's going to be later, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the way we're going to celebrate. Thanks so much uh, to the guys in Only Much Louder. Uh,